Research and Community Development Manager uh, of this faculty. And today we are going to have a research talk with uh, Dr. Simon Rosenbaum from UNSW. Yes, UNSW. And um, this talk will be moderated by our uh, professor, uh, associate professor, Dr. Sali Rahadi Asi, uh, or as we call her, Alin, Pak Alin, Dr. Alin. <laughs> Dr. Alin will uh, introduce a short, in, uh, will be, will give some short introduction of uh, Simon first, and then uh, you will take it from here, Alin. Yes, yes, my Debbie. Yep. Can you hear my voice? Of course, yes. Okay. Should I, uh, shall I just start? Yes, you can start now. Okay, thank you, my Debbie, for the short introduction. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hopefully, we, uh, we are all in good health. Uh, so today, we are going to listen to the research talk by Dr. Simon Rosenbaum. Uh, that's it's about the uh, mental health and physical activity. So before, uh, thank you, Dr. Simon Rosen, uh, Rosenbaum for uh, for coming to the Faculty of Psychology, Universitas Indonesia to give a talk about your research and then hopefully, and I'm sure we can all learn a lot from this presentation this morning. Okay, so before we start, uh, I'm going to to read uh, the uh, the biography of Dr. Uh, or Associate Professor Sim, uh, Simon Rosenbaum. So Dr. Simon Rosenbaum is an uh, academic exercise physiologist and scientia associate professors in the disciplines of psychiatry and mental health, in, uh, UNSW Sydney. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum research focuses on physical activity, trauma, and mental illness, including physical uh, physical health comorbidities which I think this is really, really interesting. So uh, Dr. Rosenbaum has published more than 230 peer review publication, including a textbook and a Lancet commission. He is the president of the Australian Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, co-chair of the Olympic Refugee Foundation Think Tank on Sport and Humanitarian Settings, and an associate editor of the journal Mental Health and Physical uh, Activity. Um, Dr. Baum has uh, led international research and capacity building projects, including working in the Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh, and has consulted to the United Nations Migration Agency in the Northeast uh, Nigeria. He also the founder of the ADI Moves, a physical activity and lifestyle program targeting women from a refugee and asylum seeker background. And since 2019, Dr. Baum uh, has been recognized by the Clarify Clarified highly cited list for mental health. So uh, hopefully this morning we can learn a lot from Dr. Rosenbaum and Dr. Rosenbaum, uh, thank you. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. I'm not sure, should I stand up or sit down or what's better? I think stand up will be better. We can see you clearly from here. Yeah. Any cameras, I'm not sure where to look. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's really uh, exciting to be here in Jakarta and to be able to share my work with you. Um, I have a terrible Australian accent, so if you can't understand me or I'm talking too quickly, please just tell me and interrupt. Yep. Um, so today I'm going to give a broad overview about some of the work we do linking physical health and mental health. Um, Two days ago, I was at UPN Jakarta talking to physiotherapists about the role of physiotherapy in mental health and thinking about new ways that we can think about treating mental illness and poor mental health. And I know we've got a diversity of backgrounds, sports psychology, so you're probably thinking more performance, but there's also a big role for some of the skills that you have in dealing with, with clinical issues as well and people living with poor mental health. Um, has anyone been to Australia before? We're very close neighbours. Yeah, you have. Yes, I have. Well, you're all welcome if you would like to come. Um, so this is my university, UNSW, here. Uh, it is about 15 minutes from this favourite 
this famous beach, Bondi Beach, which I'm sure people might have heard of before, but I know there's very beautiful beaches here in Indonesia. Um, we're also famous for the Opera House, the Harbour Bridge, kangaroos. They're not in the city. We don't have them at the university. You need to go out of the city to find some kangaroos. Now, apologies for the translation. It may not be perfect. Um, it's traditional in Australia when we have a meeting or we have a, uh, a gathering or some sort of talk that we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. So the university, the UNSW, is on the land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people. So we just acknowledge the Gadigal people and pay uh, my respects to the traditional owners of, of that land where I come from. We've just lost the pointer. Is there another way? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So a lot of people overseas and they think of Australia, think of deadly animals that are going to kill you and have this idea that this is what it looks like. And this isn't true. Okay. It's very safe. You won't find these. You will find spiders, but they're not quite that big. One of the common places they hide is under the cover in the car. So it's very common you get in the car and there'll be these big spiders in there that you need to remove. Okay, why are we talking about physical health and mental illness? And there's some very clear reasons why. And this data shows that. Okay, so this is what's referred to the scandal of premature mortality. What we're talking about here is the life expectancy of people living with mental illness. Okay. So that gap in life expectancy for people living with mental illness compared to people without mental illness is as high as 25 years. Okay. So what this data is, is this red line here is the general population. This is women. Yeah. So women without mental illness. And you can see over time, life expectancy is increasing. Yep. But we're living longer lives. This blue line is life expectancy for men. General population increasing. Yep, so globally life expectancy is increasing. The lines you can see here are the life expectancy of people living with serious mental illness. Okay, so we're talking there about schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, serious mental illness. And what you can see is this gap between people with mental illness and people without. And that gap is as high as 25 years. So if you're working in mental health, or you're working with people experiencing poor mental health, keep in mind that they are likely to die early. The reasons for this, it's not suicide. Suicide is a factor, but it's not the main reason. The main reason is preventable, premature cardiovascular disease. Okay? So obesity, diabetes, heart disease. This is what these people are dying from early than the general population. So if we think about why physical activity, why sport, which I'll talk about, one of the key reasons is the physical health of people with mental illness. Now, this issue is, is recognized internationally of being broad international significance. In 2019, we had a Lancet Commission on protecting the physical health of people with mental illness. Now, is everyone familiar with the Lancet? It's one of the most influential medical journals in the world. Yeah. Now, every so often, the Lancet has what they call commissions on topics that they deem of being international significance. So other commissions have been back pain, climate change, opioid addiction, um, air pollution, things that affect every country around the world. And in 2019, the fact that we had a commission on the physical health of people with mental illness shows that this is a critical issue globally. Okay, and you can see this quote from the commission, protecting the physical health of people with mental illness should be considered an international priority for reducing the personal, social and economic burden of mental health conditions. Now, I'm sure Indonesia is similar to Australia, whereas the mental health system doesn't treat physical health. Yeah, is that is that true here as well? They're separate. We have physical health on one side, mental health on the other. What we know is that they're completely interrelated. Now, I'm going to give you some of the statistics from this commission. 
Okay, so this is really that justification of why we are talking about this topic. If you have a mental illness, any mental illness, any mental illness, your risk of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease is up to two times higher than the general population. So if you think working as a psychologist, as soon as someone comes through your door and they're experiencing poor mental health, you need to also be thinking about the risk for these factors, the risk of poor physical health. Now, these, what we call lifestyle behaviours, so smoking, alcohol consumption, sleep, physical inactivity, and also diet, we see changes in these behaviours from illness onset. So in other words, as soon as someone is seeking help or as soon as someone is experiencing poor mental health, it is likely there are changes in these lifestyle behaviours, which we can measure. Okay. One of the other key recommendations was that mental health services should be providing sufficient access to physical health programs. And part of that includes supervised exercise interventions. Okay. One, one of the interesting arguments here is around the idea of prevention. Now, if you think about people that maybe haven't accessed a mental health service, but they might be living with poor mental health, there might be changes in these factors. Imagine if we could intervene in these factors, could it potentially prevent some cases of mental illness? And the data we have says absolutely yes. And in fact, one meta-analysis we did published in the American Journal of Psychiatry showed that if we shifted the population levels of physical activity by as little as 60 minutes, so one hour per week, we would prevent somewhere between 12 and 17% of cases of depression globally, okay? So if you think about the burden of depression, it's an enormous burden all over the world. We can prevent, potentially prevent up to 17% of cases by just getting people a little bit more physically active. The evidence is very strong and this is transcultural. This is not unique to one context. Finally, final recommendation was that these physical health services within mental health facilities should be prevention focused. So if we wait until the mental health issues are, are stable or sorted or mental health is, is uh, prioritized, it's too late. The damage will already be done to physical health. The deterioration in physical health will already occur. And this is why we need to be thinking about prevention. Any questions so far? Please let me know if, if I'm too quick. Yeah. So I can make all these slides available as well in case you need them afterwards. This is a poster from the World Health Organization, which I'm sure many of you would have seen before. And it's talking about what we call the big four risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So smoking, healthy diets, physical activity, and avoiding harmful use of alcohol. Now, we all know that this is linked to cardiovascular health. Yeah, this isn't a surprise to anyone working in health. But the evidence we have, we could essentially cross out cardiovascular disease. Sorry, my slides are a little bit delayed, which adds to the suspense. There we go. We can cross out cardiovascular disease and replace that with poor mental health because that's how strong the evidence is between these risk factors and mental health outcomes. Now, for a summary of that evidence, this is a big meta review that we published in 2020 led by my colleague, Dr. Joseph Firth. So this was a review of all the reviews available on this topic linking those modifiable lifestyle behaviors, physical activity, smoking, sleep, nutrition, with ADHD, anxiety, depression, bipolar, and psychotic disorders. Now, in this diagram, the thickness of these lines represents the strength of the evidence we have, okay? Bi-directional evidence. <coughs> so it's not just that exercise impacts these conditions, these conditions also impact exercise as well. And so again, the strongest evidence we have is around physical activity and movement. And this is open access as well. So 
that raises the question then about exercise and physical activity, given the strength of the evidence we have. So before we talk about mental illness, I want to talk about the general population. So healthy young people. And for me, this is one of the most interesting studies that's been done in this area. So this study was a randomized control trial done with young uh, exercise science students in the US. So it was led by, by Megan Edwards, who was a PhD student at the time. And what they did was they took a group of students who were active young students and they split them into two groups, the intervention group and the control group. Now, they gave everyone access to a Fitbit. Do we know what a Fitbit is? Yep. Maybe it's a little device you wear on your wrist that measures your steps, your daily step count. Yeah. So what they did in the control group, they said, wear the Fitbit and just do whatever you normally do. So no change. In the intervention group, they were trying to induce sedentary behavior. So they were trying to make people sedentary. So they said they need to keep their step count under 5,000 steps a day, which is roughly half the public health recommendations of 10,000 steps. So they were inducing sedentary behavior, making people more sedentary for one week. Now, again, these aren't people with mental illness. These are the general population, healthy young students. Look what happens to their depression scores after one week of being forced to be more sedentary. And this is what you can see here in that orange line. So depression scores have measurably increased after one week of limiting their physical activity. On the other side, and this is what's also so interesting, the control group, their depression scores got less. Now, what do we know happens when you give someone a Fitbit? It's short term, but what happens? Debbie. They, they, have, they, have to increase their... they do a bit more. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't last long. It doesn't last long. But if we give people a device to measure their activity, typically they do a little bit more activity. So what happened here was the control group did a little bit more activity and their depression scores went down. Whereas the intervention group who did less activity, they were forced to be sedentary, their depression scores went up. Now, for me, this is really interesting causal evidence about the link between physical activity, and mental health in the general population. Yeah. Now, how does this apply to clinical populations? First thing, I just want to talk about some of the definitions about what we're talking about here and the difference between physical activity, exercise, and sport, because they are different things. And often when we talk about them, we get them interchangeably and we use them as the same, but they're very different. And it's important when we think about this from a mental health perspective. So first of all, on the outside is physical activity. Now, what is physical activity? It's any bodily movement any movement. So right now I'm standing, I'm walking up and down, I'm waving my arms around. This is physical activity. Yeah. Is it likely to improve my health? Standing here, waving my arms. Possibly not. Yeah. It's not bad for me. It's good. It's part of overall health, but we wouldn't say it's going to increase my performance or it's going to increase my fitness. Yeah. So that's physical activity. That's the umbrella term. We know that physical activity, so even standing here doing more activity is linked with better mental health. But under physical activity, we have exercise. So exercise is one type of physical activity that is structured, it's deliberate, and it's done for the purpose of enhancing health or enjoyment, yeah? So it could be playing badminton with friends, going to the gym, going for a bike ride, doing yoga, whatever it is that, that you're doing for the sake of exercise. And then again, under that, we have sport, which is typically competitive, um, often team-based, not necessarily, but it's that formal organized type of physical activity. Does that make sense, the difference there? Possibly. I think sport is more competitive, right? Yep, sport is competitive, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Do we need some examples about how they're different? So let's let's think about some other examples. Here, to get to this room, we walked up those stairs. 
Yeah? Is there a lift? Is there an elevator to get here? No. Okay. If there was, but we chose to take the stairs, that's an example of physical activity. Doing more physical activity is good. We need to encourage people to be more physically active. Now, that doesn't mean that we're telling them they have to play sport. They don't. There can be lots of benefits and mental health benefits from physical activity. Thinking about ways we can get more physical activity in our daily life. Yeah? It doesn't have to be exercise. It doesn't have to be sport. All right. We'll come, we'll come back to that as well. Now, I've got a quick video here just showing a bit about the work of the Olympic Refuge Foundation. Hopefully it plays and hopefully there's some sound, but we'll see how we... This is a team like no other. A team that's creating change across the world. Leaders, businesses, coaches, athletes, displaced young people, united by the Olympic Refuge Foundation. And one goal, to rebuild young life through sport. Because when your life is in limbo, and you never face so alone. Finding refuge in a team means everything. Tunasau kama tuko wa refuge due to each other tunasika furaha nyingi. Yuko sasa tuko nje tu. On this team, we hone our talents. We build skills that last forever. We dream of what we can achieve. We belong. Powered by the Olympic spirit, everyone can play a part to make sure no young person is left out. So we can feel at home again, thrive again, and shape our own futures. That's why this is a team like no other. All right. How do we feel seeing that? Any comments? Are there any comments? Or questions? If there are any, please just someone interrupt me and we can we can go to them as thanks, Sally. Yes. A minute. Okay. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the actual evidence now that we have around physical activity, exercise, and mental health. So this is the most recent meta-analysis that we've published earlier this year. This is a review of over 41 clinical trials. Okay, so a meta-analysis in terms of the hierarchy of evidence, this is at the top. It's where we take individual trials and statistically combine the data to look at an overall effect size, which is that little diamond down here. Now, this review, there's been lots and lots of reviews um, led by our colleague, Andreas Heisel, published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine showed a large significant effect of exercise as part of treatment. Now, I think it's really important. The message we take from this is not that exercise replaces mental health treatment. It doesn't. People need talking therapy. People may need medication. People may need additional supports. But what the evidence shows us is that exercise can be a very important part of that treatment process. Okay, Not only for physical health, but also for the direct impact on symptoms. Yeah. One of the really interesting things we found in this paper was we calculated the number needed to treat. So number needed to treat, for those that aren't familiar, it's a statistical uh, calculation that tells you how many people need to receive an intervention to experience a benefit from that intervention. So for example, psychotherapy, 
the number needed to treat is four. That means that four people need to receive that intervention for one to get a benefit. The number needed to treat we calculated here for depression and exercise was two. Yeah, which is very, very significant. If we think about how cheap exercise is as an intervention, um, there's very limited side effects. There's low risk of, of uh, consequences like we have with medication. This can be a very important part of treatment. We know, though, that the challenge is how do we get people moving? How do we provide the resources and the support that actually help people to be able to participate? Okay, so I'm sort of ripping through the evidence and then I'll talk more about specific programs. This was the work that I did for my PhD, which was a randomized control trial of adding exercise to treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, so post-traumatic stress disorder is common uh, in certain groups, such as veterans or police officers, uh, people that have been at war, refugees and asylum seekers. Okay. And what we did in this study is we took 81 inpatients with severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Half of them got usual care and half of them got usual care plus exercise. Yeah. And what you can see in the red line is the control group. So they got usual care. We would expect people to get better with usual care. We would hope they're getting better. So, of course, they did. Their symptoms improved when we gave usual care. When we added exercise to usual care, we had an even greater effect. And that was significant between the two groups. Yeah, so this was good RCT evidence that adding exercise to usual care can improve PTSD symptoms. This is looking at depression, anxiety, and stress, and the effect is even greater. You don't need to be a statistician to see the difference there. And this is entirely consistent with all the evidence we have about exercise and depression. The challenge, again, is how do we help people that are experiencing those barriers of, being, of living with post-traumatic stress disorder or living with depression? How do we actually help them to get moving? And I'll talk a bit about that. Now, I don't want to seem like I'm an evangelist talking about exercise as being the treatment for everything because it's not, okay? We've got to be very careful about that. We also need to be careful that in certain contexts, like refugee context, displacement context, we don't just give people a ball and say we're providing a mental health intervention. Yeah, we've got to be very careful about that. And this is some really interesting data from Gulu in northern Uganda. This was led by, by my friend and colleague, Justin Richards, as part of his PhD. Justin evaluated a sport for development program, so a, a football competition. And these participants were mostly former child soldiers. So you're highly likely to, be, to have been exposed to very traumatic circumstances. And they participated in this football tournament, but one of the interesting things was the coaches. Yeah, and the coaches were local volunteers who knew nothing about coaching and particularly coaching children and particularly coaching children who had been exposed to trauma. So what did these coaches do? They did what they have seen on TV, on the English Premier League, which is what? What happens when you see a coach? They're walking up and down the sidelines, screaming at the players, yelling at them, yeah, in this hyper-competitive way. Now, do you think that's going to be good for someone's mental health, particularly a young person who's experienced a traumatic experiences? No, and it wasn't. Mental health outcomes got worse in this project. Yeah, so it's very important data reminding us of the importance of the quality of the sport and physical activity that we're providing and that we need expertise. So, for example, sports psychologists, sports coaches who can actually help provide these interventions. So it raises this, this question about, well, what is routine mental health care? Now, I'm assuming the experience here in Indonesia is something similar to this. Yeah, we have the psychologist treating here and we have the general practitioner or the physicians uh, or the, the sports coaches, physiotherapists treating the body, yeah? And we pretend that they're not connected, but of course they are. 
And we also know from the data I showed at the start that obesity, that risk of diabetes that leads to cardiovascular disease that results in that premature mortality and people dying early. But it raises the question about what about this game? So this is a game of Chinlon. I think there's a different word for it here in Indonesia. What's that game called with a cane ball? You're kicking like volleyball, but with your feet. Takrao. Oh, Takrao. Takrao. So it's very common in Bangladesh. And this is taken in the Rohingya refugee camps. It's an amazing game to watch. I've, I've never seen anything like it. It's extremely yeah. skillful. Is it an Indonesian sport? Yeah. Okay. It's very popular in, in the camps as well, in Bangladesh. Yeah. Um, so but that question about, well, what is mental health care? And could this be considered mental health, part of mental health care? What do we think? I'm hoping that given the evidence I've just shown you, hopefully you might look at this a bit differently in a way that this could potentially be a component of a mental health program. Yeah, if this was done properly and safely with the right supervision, with the right supports, this could be a component of mental health care. There's something missing from this picture though. Can anyone see what it is? There's something very obvious once you realize. What do we see? What can we see in that photo? I'll stop talking for a while. Mm, it's no scoreboard. Somebody is, uh, Gita is answering through the scoreboard. That's true. There is no scoreboard, but keep in mind where that's in a refugee camp. So it's a very low resource setting. Yeah, there's about 1 million Rohingya refugees living in this camp. So a scoreboard is true. What else can we see? No. Yep, absolutely. So a lack of resources. Who do we see playing? Who's playing? Adult and all men. All men, exactly. Excellent. All men. Not only all men, all able-bodied, young, healthy men. Uh, yes. Yep. I just uh, watch the to play. Yep. So young, healthy men. Now, the evidence we have about the benefits of exercise for mental health is not limited to young men. Actually, the evidence we have is that people who are most sedentary, who are most deconditioned, who are least likely to be physically active can benefit the most. So that's women. That's people living with disabilities. It's people that are excluded from games like this. But actually, they are the people that if we can support to get moving and support to participate in activity, we can have the biggest impact on mental health. Okay? So it's changing how we think about sport and physical activity and who it is for and who can have access to it. So what do we need to do to actually increase access to safe, supportive sport and physical activity for people living with mental illness. There's a few things that we need to do. And this is one of the things that we are doing together with the Olympics, the uh, Olympic Refuge Foundation, is we are trying to bring physical health and mental health professionals closer together. Yeah. So what that involves is training, lots of training. So one, training our physical health professionals in mental health skills. Things like psychological first aid, mental health first aid. Yeah. So yesterday I was uh, lecturing on, on Wednesday, physiotherapy students from UPN, Jakarta, in the foundational skills of mental health and why physiotherapists are also part of the future mental health workforce. In countries all over the world, mental health physiotherapy is gaining a lot of traction. There's a lot of evidence about how they can support patients to get moving and to participate. On the other side, we need to think about mental health professionals, so psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists. What training do they need in physical health and physical activity and sport so that they can help 
patients engage and be supportive. Yeah? The psychologists in the room, have you had training before on sport or physical activity? Not the sports psychologist, that's different. But what about people working clinically? Has there ever been uh, training or discussion about your role in supporting physical activity and nutrition and things like that? Maybe a little, maybe not. Yeah? There's a lot of places in the world where it's not, including Australia, it's not part of the routine training for mental health professionals. And we're trying to address that. So some work we've been doing, we first ran a pilot in France, in Paris with sports coaches working with, with refugees. We then went to Moldova, which is a, a small country bordering Ukraine. And as a result of the war, there's been a lot of displaced Ukrainians in Moldova and it's a very poor country. But we were there training mental health professionals and sports coaches as well. We then went to Poland where we had one psychologist and one sports coach from every region in Poland. And they came together and they're now running trainings together. So one psychologist, one sports teacher or physical education teacher. Um, and in Bangladesh recently, we were running training for the mental health staff on sport and physical activity. So again, trying to build these work for these workforces together, build those referral pathways and ensure that we can support people to get access. So I've got two, two questions here that I, I like to ask. So the first one is, am I a physical health informed mental health professional? So am I a mental health professional who understands physical health? And a couple of questions for you to consider. One, do I know the World Health Organization physical activity guidelines? Hands up if you know those guidelines. No one. That's the first thing. Please download those guidelines. I'll tell you what they are. 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. Yep. As a psychologist, even being able to recommend that to patients is a start. Yep. It won't be enough, but it's a start. So understanding those guidelines. Understanding the national nutritional guidelines. And I'm sure there are some here in Indonesia. We have Australian nutrition guidelines. There's often a one-page summary. Having that available to patients is a really useful thing to be able to give some information. <coughs> is my physical activity messaging psychologically safe? And what do I mean by that? Often when we talk about sport and physical activity, people are thinking about how they look. We're thinking about weight loss. We're thinking about getting muscles. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about how people feel as a result of participating in movement. Yeah? So we focus on enjoyment. We don't focus on aesthetics. Do I know how to access additional support? So, for example, referral pathways. In Australia... If someone is being treated by a psychologist or a doctor for a mental health issue, they can be referred to a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist to help them with their activity. That's how we translate that evidence because we know it's so effective. We then suddenly have a different workforce who can support mental health. Physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, countries like Indonesia where we don't have a big mental health workforce. Yep zoomed in a little bit and the final one do i practice what i preach and this is really really important not only for self-care but also for an understanding about what you can do for your patients and for the people you're working with and we've got really good data in australia showing that we need to start with ourselves that mental health workforce has to think about themselves how do you use physical activity and exercise for yourself what opportunities do you have to try this for yourself so that you can better support the people you work with? The other side, so when I'm talking to the physiotherapists, am I a mental health informed physical therapist? Yeah, or physical health professional? And the questions are very similar, they're just reversed. They come up. Okay, so mental health first aid training. Has anyone heard of this before? may not be here in Indonesia just yet. In Australia, we have a first aid certificate. I'm sure you have that here as well. You learn CPR, 
you learn basic first aid skills. No? Okay. So first aid is just general how to apply first aid to, to common injuries or how to look for, for signs of a stroke. Um, it's a one-day course that people, students have to do it. Most people have to do it for their workplace. But now what we have is a mental health first aid course, which provides basic skills around mental health. So how to identify if someone needs additional assistance, if someone is a suicide risk, um, and then how to get additional support. So if you're a physical therapist, my first suggestion would be make sure you do mental health first aid training to give you some skills in mental health, yeah? Secondly, if we're promoting activity and exercise, do we consider the unique barriers that people living with mental illness might have? So that could be social determinants, things like poverty. There's no point telling someone to go to a gym if they don't have shoes, they can't afford the membership, they don't live in a safe neighbourhood, uh, maybe they have childcare responsibilities, they don't have time. There's no point just saying go and exercise, it's good for you because it won't work. So we need to understand the unique barriers that those people have and how we can support them. Yeah. Again, the safe messaging, focusing on how we feel, how we're sleeping, not on how we look. And the exact same, do I know how to access additional supports? If I'm a physiotherapist and I'm working with a patient who's psychotic or has a uh, major depression, I might need support from a psychologist as well and this is where we need that interdisciplinary multidisciplinary care to do it together any questions yes yes i'm in i'm interested in uh, seeing the sepak takraw uh, exercise um, it's very common here in Indonesia, especially among the uh, community living in an underprivileged area. So uh, people living in poverty, they used to they used to do this exercise. So I think um, maybe that that is the reason why their mental health is, uh, you know, um, is no, I mean, yeah, um, living in poverty yeah. means that um, you are in a, you are having a risk in, uh, to have this mental health condition. Yeah? But um, I see that um, those living in a in in in, in a poor uh, neighborhood here in Jakarta, uh, they tend to to have this um what what so they are very good i mean <laughs> they don't have this uh, mental health illness Low levels yes. of poor mental health these symptoms of mental health um uh problem uh, are not there so um what you suggested in this um, uh, intervention program, maybe here in Indonesia, uh, it's a very common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, there's, I think just to reiterate that when we're talking about sport and physical activity, it's one tool. It's one part of a broader package. It's not going to treat everything. It's not going to remove all barriers. And of course, there's a hierarchy of needs. People need shelter, they need food. Um, but these interventions can be really important. The other aspect is around stigma. So if you're thinking about maybe people living in or people that haven't don't have a high level of education, uh, we know that sport as a, as a strategy um, can be a pathway into more traditional mental health care. Another reason why joining those workforces is so important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just yeah, reading that. a question from from the audience. Uh, Zoom. Yeah. Good. Good question about motivation. Thank you. I think it's Gita. 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 
Gita. Thank you, Gita. So motivation. Yep. Let me let me talk about that. You're absolutely right. We know that about 60 to 70% of adults globally, but particularly in high income countries, are inactive. They don't meet those physical activity guidelines. Yeah. So that's the general population. We've got a big problem around phys physical inactivity. Full stop. Of course, if you add a mental illness or you add poor mental health, you're adding additional barriers to people being active. Yeah, so it is absolutely difficult. A couple of things I would say. One, we know we need to focus on, on autonomous motivation. So we need to focus on helping people understand the benefits and then enjoying the benefits and recognizing them for themselves. Yeah, so we're not talking about simply telling people you need to be more active because it doesn't work. We have to show people and we have to support people to be able to experience it. So your question there about how, we know from the evidence what works. Yes, yeah, so we've got very clear evidence around the types of interventions that can help people get moving. The problem is, is that they require resources. It requires a safe environment. It requires a qualified instructor, ideally a health professional like a physical therapist. It requires certain equipment or, or approaches to things like physical activity counselling. So it can be done. The, the key point here is that we can do it. There's plenty of evidence available that shows how we do this. The challenge is about how do we create those services and have those referral pathways and actually support people to do it. And that leads on to the, the program that I'm going to talk about now at Addy Moves. But I think there's one more comment there. Yeah, institutions, it's a really good point. If you're talking about inpatients, absolutely. Um, so now in Australia, in, in many places around the world, we have physiotherapists and exercise physiologists embedded within inpatient facilities. Um, so it's not just physiotherapy in terms of rehab injuries, but it's physical activity providing exercise interventions for the purpose of, of in improving fitness and improving exercise capacity. Yeah, so there is a lot that we can do around promoting physical activity in inpatient settings. You know, another example here is around if we think about um, people living with severe mental illness, so things like schizophrenia, we know that the side effects of medication, they have a devastating effect on physical health. So common antipsychotic medication, typical weight gain within 12 weeks is seven to nine kilograms as soon as someone starts that medication. Now, we've got evidence from Australia and other places in the world that if we intervene at day one, so as soon as those people start taking that medication, we provide exercise and nutrition support, we can prevent that weight gain from happening and maintain the weight neutral stance at two years post. Okay. So again, it's just to say the evidence is there, the guidelines are there, mental health physiotherapy guidelines, um, and I can make all that available as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to, to Addy Moves now and talk a bit about that. And this is a project that we're running in Australia. Um, Addy Moves is a, is a unique facility that has been set up in a community organisation called Addy Road. Now, Addy Road primarily deals with food insecurity. So it has a food pantry where people can come and get free access to groceries. So the people that are coming are from all sorts of disadvantaged backgrounds. We have refugees, we have asylum seekers, we have people in contact with the criminal justice system, people experiencing sexual violence and gender-based violence, uh, people on low income. So there's lots of different supports available at Addy Road. Now, what we've done is we've taken one of these buildings that they generously gave to us and turned it into a gym but we call it like a not gym. Yeah, the idea is that it's supposed to look and feel nothing like a gym. And I'm not sure the slides aren't working again. I'm not sure if, perfect. That's what it looks like now. Okay, now that mural on the back wall is really important. That mural was painted by three refugees in Australia. Yeah, we had a big opening launch. They painted that entirely how they wanted it to look and feel. Yeah, 
That space is entirely for them. So it's really important that we asked people, what do they want? What do they need? And we focused initially on women from a refugee background because we know that there's not a lot of spaces, culturally safe spaces, physically safe spaces where they can come and exercise in a way that they want to and for free. So these were the, the artists who, who painted that. So Moz is a, is a Kurdish refugee. He's in Australia. Um, Maura, Fahat and Fahat are from Afghanistan. And they uh, arrived in Australia last year. So they painted that mural. We have three pillars to the Addy Moves program. One is research. We're doing lots of research. One is community service and impact. So we provide free exercise sessions. The other one is training and education. So we have students, exercise physiology students, public health students, they come and provide these interventions. And it also gives them exposure to a different population group that otherwise they wouldn't have the chance. We also have a clinical psychologist working with our team inside the facility. Yeah. Now we spent, before we started, we spent 12 months going through a detailed co-design process. For those that aren't familiar with co-design, it's a process of actually asking end users. So the people who you are going to ultimately be working with, how do you ask them and work with them to design what it is that you're doing? You know, we have a saying about nothing about us without us. Yeah, so we're not doing research on people. We're doing research with people together. We are partners. So that was a big, long process. This was led by, by one of our postdocs, Dr. Grace McEwen. Um, I'm not sure if we can go to the next slide. And we made a, a film out of that as well, showing, and just to be clear, we interviewed here service users and service providers. So for example, psychologists, but also participants. And we identified six themes, and these are what we call our guiding principles. Yeah, and this is what makes Addy Moves different to any other exercise facility. One is cultural safety, Two is emotional safety, accessibility, support to address basic needs, physical activity literacy, so people understand why, social and community connectedness, because we know that's so important and can be so therapeutic as well. Yeah. Okay, finally, we do have a textbook on this topic and I can make sure that there's a PDF available. Um, because it's unfortunately very, very expensive, but I can arrange that, Debbie, through through Dickie, or we can get a PDF to you. Um, just a big thanks to, to my team back in Australia, um, but also to Dina and Dickie for having me, inviting me here to Indonesia. So I'm happy to take any, any questions, and thanks for listening. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Simon, for the interesting presentation okay uh is there any questions you can write it in the chat box or you can raise your hand please <laughs> okay, actually, I got questions. Okay, so here, the uh, Diane uh, is raising her hands. Okay, Diane, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Alim and Simon. Thank you for your presentation. It really make me feel more comfortable being a uh, work as a psychology and e sport, yeah, e sport uh, field. Uh, I want to ask you, like, um, in Indonesia, when uh, taking care of the athlete as a sport psychology, usually we we couldn't. I mean, like the 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 program that we have sometimes is not uh, line with the program from the the coach. You know, it's it's more like because of the system in Indonesia, it's not. Uh, Uh, Diane, you're still muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I uh, I I need your suggestion to how we like collaborate with the coach and the the health doctor or something that 
maybe you have an experience for that so we can like apply it to to in, in Indonesia actually for the uh, athlete like sepak bola apa sih soccer uh, football ya yeah, soccer and then um field swimming or um atau sepatu roda gitu wrestler yeah yeah something like that yeah maybe you have an experience how to taking care of the athlete like that thank you Thanks, Dion, for the question. Um, it's really important, the link between performance, mental health, and, and the differing pressures between the coaches, uh, yeah. the athlete, sports psychologist. Um, a couple of things I'd say. So first, it's not my area. I don't work in elite sport, but I'm, I'm familiar with it a little bit. Um, there is an interesting emerging profession around sports psychiatry, um, and there is a great Uh, textbook of case studies around sports psychiatry and obviously covering things like eating disorders, over-exercising, uh, performance issues. So I'll send a link of that as well and some resources online. There's also some great podcasts. Um, a colleague of mine named Dr. Amit Misty, he's a psychiatrist in the UK, uh, but he's a sports psychiatrist and he's done some fantastic work championing Um, sports psychiatry as a discipline and the sort of some of the pressures that you're talking about. So I think that the best thing I can do there is not try to answer the question, but point you in the direction of, of those that can. Um, so, so Dr. Amit, for example, and I'll send the, the links through, I'll make sure it's available. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And there's also, uh, thank you, Dian, for the questions. So, uh, Simon, there's also another uh, questions from Ade Iva Murthy. That's in the chat box. Context of college life besides physical activity, making students positive mental health. Yeah, we know student mental health and well-being is a critical issue. Um, again, there's a fantastic study happening at the moment across about 70 countries, and I'm hoping that um, someone here at UI might be interested in being involved. But this is a study being led by Felipe Schuch, who is in Brazil. And he's doing a longitudinal study of student mental health um, across a number of countries. I think, again, about 70-odd countries. It would be fantastic if Indonesia was interested in, in being involved in that. I can put you in touch with Felipe. Um, we know there's different stresses, students, but we also know it's a critical time where physical activity drops off, and that's mm -hmm. a factor for poor mental health. So the recommendation for me is about what's being done to support student mental health and to support student engagement in physical activity. So in Australia, I was recently at one of the colleges where they said they had a big gender issue. The women just weren't participating. Um, mm -hmm. so they then went away. They got a group of women, the leaders from that college, to come together to break the norm and explain what might be needed to give them an opportunity. And then they implemented that program. So I think we could ask people, you know, they've got the answers. So I think starting with the students themselves and saying, what do they need? What's possible? Thank you. Okay, thank you. But uh, Maifa, do you have any other questions, follow-up questions? Um, no, but um, I'm really interested in this uh, study that has uh, been set before. And I think this is very important because Here in Indonesia, Simon, uh, we always hear about that the students here is so overwhelmed by many <laughs> pressures of assignments and so on and many classes. But I think we have to learn from the studies that has been conducted in other countries. I think this is very important. Thank you very much. Jadi dia itu ke refugee-refugee itu, mereka mengalami Oke, Mbak Iva. Oke, I think that's enough. But I really, I'm, but, but uh, Bu Alin, I'm really looking forward to that uh, studies that has been uh, mentioned by uh, Simon before. Uh, <coughs> Uh, after this okay. meeting, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the slides will be mm -hmm. given to the uh, okay. to the research unit, so we can download. Uh, so we can at least take a look at the, uh, the studies that mentioned by Simon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
Okay. Thank uh, you, Malin. Okay. Uh, okay, Simon, there's another question, but uh, the person sent it straight away to me. Uh, I'll just read it for you. So uh, the question is, is there any specific, a specific type of physical exercise that is suitable or recommended for certain mental health disorders? For example, maybe is there any specific exercise, physical exercise for like depression? Is there any specific uh, physical exercise for, um, let's say, PTSD or for anxiety disorder? There is. The specific exercise is the one that the patient enjoys. Um, That's the answer. Yeah. Yep. So it's the type of exercise that the patient enjoys, that they want to do, and that they, you know, uh, believe in. So it's our job to support them to find the type of exercise they want to do. Okay. And yeah, it's very hard to argue that one type of exercise is more superior than the other. Because, you, for example, if you told me I needed to run, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't enjoy it. I don't like running. But there's lots of other sports that I like doing. And so for me, that's what I do. And so that's what we need to do. Support people to find what works for them. Mm. And employment is absolutely critical. Oh, okay. So it means that any uh, sports or any exercise that they enjoy, that will be the most suitable for them, uh, reg uh, regardless about the psychiatric disorders or mental health disorders that they have. But what I usually say is if people are doing something, try for a little bit more, but something is better than nothing. And that's kind of summarizes the evidence in a very simple way. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then there's another. Uh, the art. Uh. Okay. And then there's another follow up questions. Uh. So this is about the athletes. Like uh, with the athletes, they can have uh. I mean, although they uh, they done a lot, they've done a lot of exercise, a lot of sports, but they still have uh they can still have like uh mental disorders so what 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 can we do uh to help the athletes like uh i think the question is because like in here uh like how we put the physical activity or exercise as a way to help uh, people having mental health problems uh getting better but how about with the athletes that having mental health issues while they they're already done a lot of exercise on their own yeah, it's a good question um so overwhelmingly what we're talking about here is people that are inactive because we know most of the population are not elite athletes mm -hmm. know that elite athletes because it seems counterintuitive they're exercising a lot but yet they still are at, <clears throat> are at high risk of poor mental health there's a whole lot of other stresses under elite athletes around performance um, and the pressure of performance that can lead to to issues and mental health issues and things like eating disorders. It's a different group. It's got unique challenges. We also know that when people retire, for example, or they become injured, they're at high risk of experiencing poor mental health. Their relationship with exercise changes over that time. And this is where I come back to that idea of enjoyment. And with those people, it's really important to look at how can they uh, refine that passion and that enjoyment for movement that isn't linked to the competition. And that's absolutely critical to then regain some of those benefits. Yeah. Mm, okay. Thank you. So you mean, so uh, what you're saying is, I just try to make sure that I understand the answers. So what, so what you're saying is that as long as they can find other uh, exercise to do that uh, not really part of the competitiveness that they have because they're an athlete, but it's more because they're doing it because they enjoy it. That will be one of the things that can be done for them. Is that and also recognizing that some people need additional support. They need talking therapy, they need medication, and that's all totally fine. Mm -hmm. And movement can still be part of their program, part of their treatment. Oh, okay, yeah. So they still need other support. It's not only like the exercise part, uh, finding some tests, finding some exercise that is kind of that enjoyable for them, but also they got other like talking therapy, like counseling and also so, uh, in, uh, ability to have to identify, identify their support system as well. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. I think there are other questions in here. Uh, like it's from Ibu Ratna. Ratna Juita is in the chat box. Like since the pandemic, I see more and more students from good schools become more ob obese. I assume it comes from not exercising and junk food. Does it also happen in Australia? Well, uh, are there some strategies to prevent that? 
pandemic's been really interesting. We've there's so much conflicting data from different snapshots of the pandemic about the overall impact on physical activity levels. Mm -hmm. There's some, some data showing it was good for activity because people, you know, I don't know what it was like here, but in Australia during the lockdowns, we had very strict lockdown and you were only allowed outside for a handful of reasons, mm -hmm. but it was exercise. And it was one of the first times that we saw the World Health Organization promoting exercise for mental health which was really good to see. It was fantastic. Um, but we have other conflicting studies showing that obviously activity, particularly physical activity, incidental physical activity, walking mm -hmm. upstairs, you know, getting that incidental movement decreased because there was less opportunity for it. So that has subsequently had an impact. Um, don't, I'm, no, I'm not answering the exact question, which was, is it the same in Australia? Yes, we have seen changes in rates of obesity, lack of participation, you know, but it's also thinking about generational changes. We know that screen time is a big issue. Um, adolescent physical activities on the decline at those critical points of transition. Um, and basically we have not been good physical activity promotion uh, over the past 40 years or so has not been that effective, you know, where rates of inactivity are increasing and that's a big issue. So yes, it's, it's, it is the same in Australia. Okay, all right, okay. Thank you, Simon. Okay, Maratna, does it answer your questions? Yes, thank you. But uh, I was also asking whether um, whether there is a particular strategy to to have the the pupils, the students to to move more. I think we've got to think about context. So if we're talking about students then physical education opportunities in class is critical. And that's a whole body of work. And there are experts in, in physical education that do that work. If we're thinking about adolescence and, you know, those, those some of those transition periods, we need to then think about do our services match the needs of the people we're targeting at that point in time? You know, I think we the evidence is clear that prevention is better than cure. Maintaining a positive relationship with physical activity throughout the lifespan that begins in, in childhood and adolescence. So looking very carefully about our physical education classes at school, um, there's some really interesting data showing that one of the biggest predictors of adult physical activity is someone's experience in physical education at school. Now, if people are having a negative experience at school because of a focus on competition, because of a focus on aesthetics, uh, they're likely to have a negative relationship with physical activity later in life. So I think the strategy there for me is really important that we focus on schools and on providing enjoyment and linking enjoyment with physical activity from a young age. And we're likely to have an impact down, down, down the track. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Maratna. Okay. And here we have uh, I, Isaiah Rainima. Uh, he's uh, raising his hand. Please, Isaiah. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, uh, first of all, I'm from Fiji, Fiji Islands, uh, studying here in Universitas Indonesia. Uh, I, I have worked for the prison system in Fiji for the last 10 years, and um, this is uh, one of the things that um, I come across uh, daily on um, admissions uh, from inmates and um, things like that. So I was just wondering, what about the citizens in prisons and correctional institutions with mental illnesses? Like, first of all, they are convicted, they have mental illness, and they are inside prison. I mean, that's, that's a lot of pressure like going on to, um, to the person who's got mental issues or psychological deficit. Um, what, does, what, are, what are some of the advices or some of the things that um, you have found out like over the years of research about our um, populations of people inside the prison system? Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a really interesting question. Um, 
And it would be good to, to connect afterwards because we're about to offer a scholarship in Australia for someone from the Pacific to come to our Exercise and Sports Science Australia conference in May and we're going to fund one person. And it sounds like you're doing some fantastic work that might be eligible, so please get in touch. Um, look, there is a bit of evidence around prison system and programs, particularly qualitative work. There's obviously factors associated with the supervision and the quality of the supervision. And that's what I come back to around the sports coaches in, in the football program in, in Uganda. You know, the quality of the training and having people that are qualified to supervise sport that also understand that context is going to be critical. Um, I think it's a really exciting area and there's lots of opportunity. Um, I haven't personally worked in prison, so I can't give you any useful advice, but I do know of some of the research that I can send to you around that um, because it's a, it's in a really important area, the link with trauma, the link with poor physical health, um, the impact on things like seclusion and restraint, no social cohesion. Uh, there's lots of potential benefits, but there's also risks. Um, you know, I think there's probably room for some really good co-design work to be done in that area. So to sit down with people in a prison, people running the prison, people working in the prison, to try to capture what it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see. Uh, does it answer the questions? Um, yeah. Um, um, additionally, um, you know, some of the things that we have to consider while working in prison is the security issues. Like we might come from the rehabilitation side, uh, I might come from the psychological perspective, but then the prison system also have its security measures in place, which, which um, has to complement each other. We cannot bring about um, psychological issues or psychological treatments and ignore the fact that they are there for security reasons. So most of the times um, security um, supersedes a psychological interventions because it is a prison, because of the offenses they come with, because of their behaviors. Um, these are things that are taken into consideration. So those are some of the issues that we face like daily, um, every year, because, I mean, I've been working with them, like they come with all sorts of psychological issues. Some might come with uh, substance, substance induced psychosis, some come with depression, some come with schizophrenia. Um, you know, like we have to we have to try and look at all the all the um, sides of things, but still our security in prisons sometimes supersede our psychological interventions. Of course, and, and thank you for that comment. The only thing I would just add is imagine if these interventions were resourced and treated as therapeutic within the prison. So imagine if this wasn't just considered an added extra, you know, uh, uh, it would be nice to have bonus. Imagine if it was actually resourced as a clinical intervention, then it would be very different. And that's actually where we need to get to with these things. So that, that example is very, very appropriate because it tells the issue about what we're trying to say around actually resourcing these interventions and thinking about them properly as clinical, as therapeutic, not just something we do if we have time. Thank you, Asa. Thanks for the comment and hopefully we can- Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Isaiah. So move on to is 90, Ines. Uh, okay, Ines, uh, raise her hand, please, Ines. Thank you. Hello, Simon. Um, so I'm a, actually a physical therapist. So I'm wondering, in a physical therapist, we have passive assisted exercise, and it often we use on people with handicap, like people with stroke or people who cannot really move their body. Uh, what do you, what is your thought about using a physical uh, passive assisted exercise for mental health problem because if we see depression as a, as a whole body problem they won't be able to move their body even if they willing to so what do you think about that thank you thank you for the question i think this is the, the superpower of physiotherapists because your job is to help people get moving and so you're able to provide these therapeutic interventions that can break down some of the barriers to help people get moving so that's fantastic. Anything you can do to support someone to be able to engage in an activity that is enjoyable and appropriate for them, 
is is fantastic. So those assisted exercises are part of building capacity and strengthening and providing uh, a foundation where a person can participate in in further activity. So I think that sounds great. Okay, thank you for the answer. Okay, okay, thank you, Ines. So now we are moving on to the questions uh, in the chat in the chat box it's one from edward and edward adrianto i work with survivors of terrorism act and it is quite hard for someone with burn skin to do some exercise because it will age are there any recommendation uh, or any recommended physical exercise for them thank you can't answer that i'm sorry that's not not my area i haven't worked with burns in particular mm -hmm. um what i have worked with is people that have been exposed to traumatic experiences like terrorism uh -huh. and that itself can be a barrier but I can't I can't I'm not the right person to answer about the burns I'm sorry um oh. there would be a specialist that would be far better placed so apologies I can't answer that okay okay Simon thank you okay now we are moving on to another uh questions uh Okay, so in, this is from Amran. A lot of people did, did, didn't know what type of exercise they like because they never try any exercise. Is there any specific time range for the patient to experiment with a lot types of exercise so they know what the exercise or physical activity that they like? It's never too late. I mean, we there's a saying, the second best time is now. Have you heard that before? Yes. Second best time is now. So it, you're never too old. I mean, I've, some of the biggest impacts I've seen working directly with patients is working with really older people who have never mm -hmm. exercised before. Some of the most memorable things I've done is working with older Syrian refugees um, and teaching them how to do strength training with an elastic band, mm -hmm. um, and watching their, their eyes light up as they find themselves in their body and they feel their muscles moving mm -hmm. and learning a new skill. Um, so no, I think there's, it's never too late. It's about providing the support, experimenting, giving people an opportunity, um, but having that safe supportive environment by which you can do it. Oh, okay. Can you like elaborate a little more about having the safe environment for them to do it? It's more like physical environment or something that is also aligned with their culture as well. Oh, so when we talk about safety, we're talking cultural safety, uh -huh. we're talking psychological safety. So, for example, our gym at Addy Moves, we've you know set that up for women from a refugee background. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that they need. For example, it needs to be a women-only space on certain times. They need to know that men aren't coming so they can exercise. Mm -hmm. so they need blinds on the window so that people can't see in. They needed a change room. They may need childcare. Mm -hmm. On a support for children. It's mm -hmm. identifying those barriers and seeing how can we break those down Mm -hmm. And not thinking about a gym, not only as a place for rich, young, privileged people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there are also a, there are a cultural safety that need to be considered as well, as well with the psychological safety too. So uh, can, is it okay if you like share a little bit of like what you did with the older couple of, from, uh, of the Syrian refugee, like how to, like, do they need to be like, uh persuaded to do the physical activity or they already like in terms of they already like ready to do it they were curious i think movement is like so people inherently understand uh -huh. that if we have an opportunity to move we feel a bit better like, that's it it's as simple as that no. what people don't have is opportunity they don't have access they don't have support they don't have the resources they need to participate so that's actually where our job, if we think about a health professional, we're trying to make people healthy. We're trying to keep people healthy, mm -hmm. just treat disease. We're trying to prevent as well. Mm -hmm. um, if we think about that, then what systems and services and structures are we building to support people um, to be able to participate? Okay. So it's more like how to establish the system and then the support for them. Because yeah. they they inherently already know that moving is better rather yeah. than just staying inactive. Fun. How is their social connection? How do we create something that people want to do? Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. So there's a lot of questions actually. I'm really glad. I mean, I'm really happy that uh people are very are really interested in this uh topic because this is a very important one, in my opinion. Okay. So there's a quick question. How about connecting to the nature, like bird uh bird washing with group, or is it the same with exercise? Or it's more like exercise is really uh, refers to the gym or indoor activity. Great question. There's something called the blue gym and the green gym. Have you heard of this before? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so the green gym refers to exercise done outside in nature. It looks like there might be an added benefit of the green gym. So being in nature. Um, equally, there's the blue gym. So if you're, you know, within water. Now, the caveat, I would just say, the caution is that not everyone has access to a beautiful green environment around the world. Yeah, yeah. So we've got to be considerate of that too. Of course, we're lucky enough to live in a beautiful environment with access to a safe outdoor environment where you can exercise excellent, even better. If you don't, we then that's one of the barriers we need to think about. You know, there's no point me going to the refugee camp in Bangladesh and saying everyone here needs to run 150 minutes a day. That's <laughs> like it's just that that's that's not helpful. Yeah. That's not actually sure. useful. That's not culturally appropriate. That's mm -hmm. not available in that environment. So my job as a health professional there is to say, well, what can we do? What's possible? What do people want to do? What do they need? And how do we make that happen? Yeah. So yeah. short answer, nature, perfect, beautiful if you can. Okay. Yeah. So it's great, but yeah, it also depends on the accessibility of that, right? Okay, thank you, Simon. And here in uh, in the Zoom room, we have Putri Utami. She already raised uh, is raising her hand. Okay, Putri, please. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Simon. My name is Putri. Um, I have a a little question for you. Um, I was um starting my gym journey in um two months ago and. Before I start my gym journey, uh, I have a lot of anxiety when I was graduate from the university. And in the first year, I was uh, consume a lot of uh, lansoprazole. There is a drug for uh, GERD. I mean, like GERD. When when my anxiety comes, and then when I starting my journey gym in Two months ago, I don't um, consume the lensoprazole again. Does it correlate that gym and anxiety and my anxiety was gone, Simon? It, I'm it, really sorry for my English. No, no, <laughs> I no. my best. Your English is definitely better than my Indonesian. Um, <laughs> what is it? I, I had a little bit of trouble hearing so i think what i heard was that you were taking medication and you started yeah. going to the gym and yeah. there was a positive outcome is that right yeah that's correlated that gym and my gut so, so sorry the the question just clarify the question one more time Do, uh, that's correlated that my gym journey in two weeks uh, in two months ago correlated to increase my anxiety before before I uh one year ago I consumed drugs to reduce my anxiety. Yeah, I I it's difficult to comment and obviously I wouldn't want to comment on a specific case and it's also I'm you know I'm not a psychiatrist so um, I'm, I'm reluctant to ever talk about medication, except that what I do say is that it's really important that we don't shame people for taking medication or needing medication. It's absolutely a part of what's needed. It's very important. Exercise and physical activity doesn't replace medication. It's an extra tool. Some people, in some contexts, exercise may be enough for some mild to moderate conditions. Uh, in other situations, people can benefit from exercise and still need medication and still need talking therapy, and that's not a, a problem. That's not a, a, a failure of the person. It's not their fault. Um, it's thinking about the different tools we have in our tool belt. 
to help manage things like anxiety and depression, which we know are extremely common and affect a really large amount of the population. So I don't need to confirm my trust again after this, maybe. I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't say that. I would say it's important that you talk to your doctor who is prescribing the drugs. And if you're getting benefits from lifestyle change and from exercise, that's fantastic. That's great. But definitely don't make changes to any prescribed medication without talking to, to the prescriber. Thank you, Simon. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Putri, for your uh, questions. Okay. Uh, there's another question in the chat box. Okay. I can answer this one very yeah. Quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yes, there is a tool and there is actually, you might think that I planted this question, but I promise you I didn't. <laughs> there is a tool called the SIMPAC, which stands for Simple Physical Activity Questionnaire. And that was a tool we developed in 23 countries and we tested it across a thousand people with mental illness um, in 23 countries. We don't have an Indonesian version at the moment. So if anyone is interested, there's a research project there to translate and validate that scale here in Indonesia. Um, it's a five item clinical interview. Now we know that physical activity measurement is inherently unreliable. So even without a mental illness, if you ask someone, how much exercise did you do? You get a terrible answer. And we know that the validity of those self-report questionnaires are terrible. Uh, so we spent five or six years with an international team developing a new one. And the result was that it's slightly less terrible than the others. Um, but it's a, a clinical interview. And with a little bit of training, we can explain how to use that because it has set up to give a much better, because uh, it's a the structured question to give a more accurate uh, representation. It is a clinical tool. It can be done. It takes anywhere from three to, to seven minutes, depending if you're a, a sports person or a physiotherapist, you might take longer because you might use that data to inform your physical activity counseling. If you're a psychiatrist and you only have a very short amount of time, it can be done very quickly as a crude screening tool. Um, so that's the SIMPAC. We published that in BMC Psychiatry in 2020. And there's also one other tool called the physical activity vital sign, which is very, very quick. It's a very crude measure to assess against the physical activity guidelines. And I can make sure that both of those are available. I can send them to you. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, Simon. I think we are all very happy if we can have the that measurements. And then you said that with the SIMPAC, it needs to have a little bit of training before we are able to do that. This uh, yeah, it's just noting that if you just give it to someone as it's written, mm -hmm. you get the, the validity will be as bad as every other questionnaire. So, for example, the, the key issue, and I'll just like underreport sedentary time. So the way that we set that up is that essentially accepting the number that we actually the the questionnaire gets people to account for a twenty four hour period. Mm -hmm. They say that they're only sitting for five hours. Mm -hmm. We actually would subtract that from 24 and flip it so oh. for, for 19 hours. Okay. And when we looked at the data with accelerometers, that was far more reliable. So mm -hmm. really about it's also having a conversation because we know if you tell someone, yeah, so it's a, we can go through this another time, but it's, it's very easy to use, but in mm -hmm. five or 10 minutes of training, it makes a bit more sense. Yeah. And because it, this is a clinical interview, it is, it's better to like give it like, we are talking or like having a conversation as well. Is that Definitely. Because if you just, if it's just self-completed by a patient, mm -hmm. you'll get a terrible answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not even just a patient, self-completed by anyone. Even if there's no problem with them, and you'll get a terrible answer. Because self-activity <laughs> is hard. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I can understand that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then there's another question. Uh between obesity and mental illness which direction the directionality of yes. that relationship yeah interesting question it's bi-directional it's both if you're obese you're less likely to engage in activity and there's a lot of barriers there but similarly if you're experiencing 
depression, you're more likely to be social with socially withdrawn, to consume a poor diet, to be inactive, which leads to more obesity. There's this vicious cycle. Which one comes first? Don't really know. Doesn't really matter because we need to break the cycle somehow. So <laughs> I, I think it's it's bi-directional and the important mm-hmm. uh, for mental health professionals is to just acknowledge that you have a role in promoting positive physical health. You know, we, we often hear psychiatrists say to me, well, this isn't my job. I'm a psychiatrist. And it's like, well, you're still a doctor. You know, your job is actually health. And if your patients are getting really fat and at high risk of, of cardiovascular disease, you have mm-hmm. a role in actually trying to prevent that. Okay. Yeah. And then also with these questions, I have a follow-up questions actually with these. Uh, so this is, it's a vicious cycle, right? Between obesity and then mental health. Uh, what I'm trying, uh, what I'm asking is like, is there any, like between those two, which one that is less, uh, which one that is easier? I know both are not easy, but which one that is more easier yeah. uh, to be tackled first? Yeah. Focus on the behavior we're trying to change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't focus on weight. Don't focus on, on measuring you know, body weight. That's not important. Focus on the behavior and mm-hmm on linking that behavior to how someone feels Mm -hmm. so for example in a lot of our research i don't measure weight anymore if we run an exercise intervention i don't measure weight because it's Mm -hmm. a message the other thing that i'll just this is very very important exercise is not useful for weight loss Mm -hmm. i'll say that again exercise is ineffective for weight loss if people want to lose weight they need to address dietary change If people want to feel better and people want to sleep better and people want to reduce symptoms of depression, reduce symptoms of anxiety, improve health outcomes, exercise is good. But we have to disconnect exercise from weight loss. And this is where I think Instagram and the the (laughs) fitness has a lot Mm -hmm. to answer for because they send us these horrible messages. And they've actually made what it does is it makes people feel that exercise isn't for them, that they don't belong that it's not safe for them to be there. And that's what we need to reclaim. We need to reclaim that idea that actually movement is for everyone. You know, and we, um, I made a little video recently with my university where we we framed it as a human right, that actually if health, if we all have the right to health mm-hmm. and exercise is such a critical part of health, then we all should have the right to be able to exercise in a way mm-hmm. that's safe and appropriate for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in in here. At least in Indonesia, from what obs- uh, from what I observe, like if we are saying that okay, I'm trying to do exercise, and then a lot of time it is con- uh, people will uh, associate it with okay. So are you trying to lose weight? That kind of stuff. I don't know. It is is it the same in Australia as well? Absolutely, but we need to change that. So how many people go to a gym and they tell you okay, what's your weight loss goal? But why? How often you should go to the gym and they say well. Do you want to sleep better? How do you feel? <laughs> do you want to feel a bit better? Do you want to have a bit more energy? And that's mm-hmm. what we're focusing on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the association needs to be like disconnected, right? Disassociated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So moving on, there's another question from Atalia Lumunon. What are the best or effective and immediate strategies to increase a healthy lifestyle? including physical activity and what is your opinion about promoting this physical or healthy lifestyle intervention with the social marketing strategy especially using the digital or tech like social media thank you interesting um i wish i if i had an answer to this i'd be very rich <laughs> <laughs> i okay a couple of things so social media can be good mm-hmm. we one of my old PhD students, her entire PhD was providing an online physical activity intervention for emergency service workers with PTSD. So we set up a private Facebook groups and we invited people. We had peer support workers. So that lived experience, which is so critical. Uh, so I think the advice I would say is one, we need to ask people, don't make decisions, don't assume what people need, ask them. And ask them properly, really take time to understand who are the people you're working with and what do they need? What do they want to to be physically active? We've got to change our our assertions and our assumptions around this. Mm -hmm. Uh, What was the other part to that question? It was lifestyle chain, digital. Look, there's digital apps. Some social media stuff is really good. There are apps available. There's a big review that came out yesterday on digital lifestyle interventions for mental health. 
um, in psychological medicine. I was just like, I was skimming it last night, which is why I, I know of it. Um, but that's come out of Dr. Joe Firth's group. So that's probably really worth reading. Um, but yeah, I think starting thinking about enjoyment, thinking about linking the behavior to how we feel is really important and trying to understand what are the barriers for that person. Okay. All right. So, uh, Atalia, does it answer your questions? Do you have any follow-up questions? Or is it really good? Let, let's wait. I don't think I've ever had so many questions in my life. This is amazing. <laughs> So it good, right? So it means that we are uh, paying attention to you to your uh, lecture because it's really interesting, actually. <laughs> okay. Um. There's another question from Rahmawati. Mm. Oh, okay. So wait. So, uh, Atalia, uh, can you um can you ask the question directly to Simon? Uh, okay. Hello, Simon. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I just wondering, is there any immediate strategy for people to, yeah, to, uh, to, uh, to adopting healthy lifestyle or to go to the gym? Because, uh, yeah, you have said that the important key is the enjoyment and maybe the, uh, the facility or the access that we need. But maybe is there any suggestion in the individual individual strategy that maybe as we in that we we that who work in psychological setting can yeah um apply and say to other people who in needs like what they should uh, do or what uh, that ignites that what that can ignite their thinking that oh yeah we can go to physical uh, we can go to the gym or to eat because it's sometimes um it's very hard for other people to uh so uh yeah to think that they want to uh eat healthy or to go to do more activity a physical activity. I just want to know: Is there any immediate strategy that we can tell people to adopting healthier lifestyle? Thank you. I have a very quick answer to that. And that's to start with yourself. Yeah. So we've got some data on this in Australia. Um, whenever we run a program in a new mental health facility. We actually don't work with patients, we work with staff. And we get the staff on board first and we engage them and we provide them with the exact same program we provide patients. So we published this data in 2020 in the Health Promotion Journal of Australia. It was called Keeping Our Staff in Mind. And we provided 212 mental health staff with a four-week lifestyle intervention. And what we measured was the changes in their knowledge, their confidence, their attitudes, and suddenly all these things started happening. And I'll tell you one story. We had this male nurse who had been a nurse, a psychiatric nurse for a very long time. And he was very, very angry with me being there. He thought it was ridiculous. He wasn't interested. He kept telling me that if he wanted to be a personal trainer, he would have studied personal training, not psychiatric nursing. Okay. So he was very negative. All around him, we had this intervention happening with the staff. We gave them Fitbits that I mentioned before. Now, about four weeks later, he came up to me and said, do I have any spare Fitbits? And I said, yeah, of course. And I gave him Fitbit. About four weeks after that, he was coming in and showing the dietitian what he had made for lunch. Now, that had had such an enormous change in his behavior, he suddenly started running walking sessions with his patients. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it completely changed his behavior. That wouldn't have happened if I just went in there and started working with the patients. We have to change the culture of mental health work. We have to change the culture of mental health settings. It's the same example. Where we actually think about these interventions as the therapeutic clinical interventions that they can be. Yeah. And that we resource them appropriately. So that's a long winded answer to say, start with yourself. We need staff to be active first. It's also part of your own self care. This is stressful work. You know, working in these environments takes a toll on you. You need to be looking after yourself as a priority. 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Atalia, for your questions. This is really a good one. Okay, we have an, a, a couple of questions left, we, and we're also almost to the end of our session. It's from Rahmawati. So in our rehabilitation institutions, we are dealing with delinquent under age who are criminals already caught by police and dealing with court progress uh, with the court. And then of uh, this uh, delinquent uh, often performing uh, aggressive behavior in daily life. Is there any proof that exercise or sport can help in reducing this uh, their aggressive beha uh, behavior? Um, so, uh, because in our dorm, uh, we use this in order to help reducing their aggressive behavior. And is there uh, is that really beneficial for them, or should we change the other uh, to other kind of treatment? Thank you. Great question. Um, so there is a bit of data around seclusion and restraint in intensive care environments, mental health intensive care environments. They're so not specific to to children. But in Australia, at our at our MICU, our mental health intensive care unit, we do have an exercise physiologist providing interventions, and that's been very very effective. That obviously requires very specific skill set, mm -hmm. and requires a partnership with the person providing the exercise, uh -huh. the mental health professionals. <clears throat> and this mm -hmm. is where that partnership is so important in these contexts. Yeah, because you can't have, let's say, a physical therapist or an exercise scientist going into that facility without training, someone with those skills in exercise and physical activity could support the mental health professionals to utilize these interventions. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't have specific research around that, um, but there is a bit of seclusion and restraint. I would say it's a partnership, you know, get, get some, some physiotherapy students or something, experiment, see what can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so uh, the so partnership is the key yeah, is the key to uh giving them more uh more assistance or more program that will help them. Yeah, exactly. If you think about exercise, this is another analogy like medication. You know, you don't just go to the doctor and say, "Give me some medication," and that's it. You know, give me some random medication. Think about exercise the same. We've got to support people. What type? How are they doing it? To do it okay yep okay okay simon so uh there's now there's uh i'm going back to the zoom room there's uh one person miss uh, donny hendrawan he is already like raising his hand uh donny hello malin hello simon uh, yeah. thank you for your appreciate appreciate speech <clears throat> i would like to ask about the uh, contributing factor for co higher cognitive function in mediating between the sport, exercise, and uh, uh, mental health problem or mental health uh, condition. Do you have any study, or do you have uh, do you have run any specific study that is related to the higher cognitive function for that? Thank you. Yeah, so you talk about the mechanisms and potentially what's happening in the brain when we're exercising. Is that right? Yeah, maybe uh, just not only for the brain, for example, for the uh, neurocognitive uh, functions, such as the process for working memory, because one of my our uh, previous study related to the sport and uh, uh, executive function, uh, we uh, assess the difference between the uh, type of sport and the uh, uh, outcome of the executive function for the middle children, something like that. So I mean that when you explain about the uh, someone who have a mental illness and then after they make exercise and then the symptoms getting better, is there any relation to the mediative factor? For example, they change the process of the brain, they change the process of a higher neurocognitive function and that what kind of neurocognitive function that could be uh, decrease of the symptoms, something like that. Great, great question, Donny. Um, it's not my area, but I can point you in the right direction. So we have done a little bit of work looking at hippocampal neurogenesis in response to exercise. Um, there was some, you know, a lot of excitement with those Ericsson studies and also Peter Falkai's work showing evidence of hippocampal neurogenesis in response to exercise. Uh, we replicated that in, so Peter Falkai's group 
did that in patients with schizophrenia and showed about, I think it was about a 20% increase or something in hippocampal volume after 12 weeks of, of training. We replicated that with young people with psychosis and despite a significant increase in fitness showed absolutely no change in hippocampal volume. Uh, we subsequently did a meta-analysis led by, by Joe Furth, again, showing, you know, not, not a great, you know, a little bit of, uh, of a signal around hippocampal neurogenesis, but it seems to be much stronger in, in rats. Um, there is a review that only just came out recently looking at connectivity, brain structure, and the impact of exercise. Um, so there is a lot of work happening in that space. You know, my work is far more at the implementation end as opposed to the, the mechanistic side of things. But I can send you through that, that paper. Um, the other paper to look at is by Aaron Candola and Brendan Stubbs, which is a review of the mechanism um, associated with the, the mental health benefits of physical activity. So a lot of stuff around HBA axis and, and, and uh, hippocampal neurogenesis and some of the potential mechanisms. What I would just stress, though, is that break that down into the acute benefits, the physiological benefits, but also long-term adaptations because they're all different. And if we <clears throat> a patient with severe mental illness you know, let's say we get them out of bed, we walk for five minutes and they go back to bed. That can be beneficial to how they feel, but is that having any impact on cardiovascular fitness or hippocampus or cognition? No, probably not. But there is a benefit to the social benefit in terms of that feeling of accomplishment. So I think we're, we're hitting very different systems at very different times with exercise, both acute and chronic adaptations. So just where we think about trying to simplify why does this work, I think it's more complicated than, than a single answer. I see. What I'm trying to say is, uh, I'm just curious, before uh, doing exercise, should we change, the, for example, the cognitive paradigms, for example, motivation, and then uh, social cognition, and uh, of course, uh, the other aspect of cognitive that after changing the cognitive aspect, and then we can uh make easier to make other people do exercise something like that and it will help for the mental health something like that how do you think about that yeah then it's a bit of work around the timing of intervention so for example yeah. in ptsd there's work happening with combining exercise with exposure therapy um yeah. an idea that potentially doing it before um, encourages BDNF expression, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which might have an impact on memory consolidation. Um, I, For me, it's just thinking about efficacy research versus implementation research. I think there's lots of questions to answer about this from an efficacy perspective that's super interesting. It's not the work I do, but it's very important. Um, I think from an implementation perspective, I would say that we have enough evidence to move already and to say, right, how do we actually address the motivational deficits? What needs to happen to actually get people moving? Um, mm -hmm. So I know I'm not, I'm not really answering your question. I think they're very interesting questions. I think you probably know more than me about those those questions, those mechanistic issues, um, but I can forward some of those the research that might be relevant. Okay, cool. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Marlin. Yeah, thank you, Danny, for the questions. Thank you, Simon, for the answers. And we have, uh, oh, okay. There's a question uh, about uh, like doing, maybe if you uh, like, do, uh, wait, this question is about, so Simon, your research is very inspiring, helping the refugees. Do you have any interest to do research work with people or with psychologists who usually work for survivor from any field? Yeah, of course, we'd love to, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, I just wondering. So if like uh one of uh the attendants in uh the participant in here, or let's say I I'm interested to do to um to do work with you in terms of physical uh physical exercise and mental health. Uh, is there any email that we can reach you? I mean, can we reach you through email, or is there any other mode to reach you? Email is best. Um, I'm just, I'll be honest, I'm on the road now for nearly two months. So I go from here to Colombia and I'm doing a lot of talks. I might be slow in replying, but it doesn't mean I don't want to. So please, please get in touch because we're very open to collaborations and would love to, 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 you know, if there are things we can do together, we'd absolutely love to. And please visit us in Australia as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, 
So, uh, so we are going. So uh, you are. Um, we can reach it through email. So uh, I think your email is the is uh in the UNSW website, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So before we end this session, is there any questions that you still want to ask, uh, Simon here? One more questions. You mind just scrolling down in the chat so I can read them. Okay. Yeah. I think it's there's all there's. This that's it. I think there's no other, uh, there's no other questions in the chat. Uh, in the chat box. Yeah. Thanks for being such a great group. This was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested, actually. I mean, like because I do a lot of work with uh people having chronic pain, and uh I I just finished doing the CBT. Uh, uh, uh it's a controlled uh it's a randomized controlled trial for CBT uh, for chronic pains in which we put like a lot of uh, physical activity as well for them. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if we don't, uh, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for your uh, amazing lectures and uh, for your uh, answering the question is really like really really enlightening enlightening and hopefully you have a good uh, flight to colombia it's quite far from here right yeah it's three flights it's gonna be a long long trip yeah yep yeah there will be connecting flight i'm sure <laughs> yeah because thank we don't have direct flight <laughs> there okay so thank you very much uh so okay come here do we have like a photo group photo or we just like or can I just like close the uh, session? Come on. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, we don't need to do the group uh, photo. So thank you very much, Simon, uh, for your time. Thank you very much for the participants. Uh, terima kasih, Bapak Ibu, for coming here. Hopefully, we all learn something uh, from here. I'm sure we learned something. So hopefully, we can meet in other research uh, series uh, session from Faculty of Psychology, Universitas Indonesia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.